Cougs house. The Longwood Lancers have a lot to prove, and these Cougars have to make sure that they don't. You are Locked On Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked on Cougs, daily podcast all about your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Houston-born teacher and coach, Parker Antrith. And whether you're a Houston fan or just a hater who came to step by, thank you for making Locked on Cougs your first listen of the day. If you join the conversation and you just don't know what to tell us, uh, say down below somewhere in the comment section what your favorite fast food french fry is hot debate in the ancient household these days today's show is brought to you by nissan i'll tell you more on that later but first gotta get into some different things about the houston cougars matchup with the longwood lancers now i also want to tell you some at the end of this episode about what things look like in the south region and march madness more broadly because obviously houston's gonna have some sort of an eye on the big picture i want to make sure i tell you some of the key guys for longwood as well but I need to, need to, need to tell you a little bit about this team as a whole. Now, as far as the history of the team goes and how this program got to be where they are, the rapid growth from being Division One for the first time in 2007, frankly being co-ed for the first time in 1976, to being you know conference champion twice in three years that they are now, please check out yesterday's episode with Ron Brown. Uh, it was a great interview. I really liked having Ron on. Good dude, Coach Lanchers, uh, and their history full-time. But in the present tense, I got to look at this team. And frankly, Ron said at one point that he was surprised that Longwood got to be a 16 seed. Um, honestly, yes, they were fifth place in the regular season in the Big South Conference. But when that conference tournament, he kind of thought might elevate them a little bit higher. And after watching a couple games, I watched UNC Asheville and High Point. They were the more competitive games in conference play. I didn't get to go watch the Dayton game. Honestly, it was hard to find more than a couple minutes of highlight clips on that one. Uh, I have to say that I feel like he's right, though. Right, um, Their biggest non-conference game was a nine-point loss to Dayton. That's also a common opponent with Houston. Houston played Dayton in the Charleston Classic. Houston won, at, obviously, and Longwood lost. So, Common opponent, it's not necessarily the transitive property, right? But it's an interesting comparison there. Uh, St. Bonaventure beat Longwood by four. It was a big game. And in the conference play, uh, High Point was the regular season champion. Uh, and then, frankly, Longwood beat them twice once in the conference tournament, which was held at High Point. So impressive resume for sure. Offensively, I was impressed with um, how like determined they are to do what they do. They shoot very very few threes, less than a quarter of their points come from behind the arc. Uh, that's 338th in the nation at 23.1% of their points. 28.3% uh, of their field goals attempted are from behind the arc, and that's 346th nationally. Uh, they do shoot 34.2% from behind the arc, but they do have such a low volume, it's kind of negligible. They shoot over 42 two-point field goals per game. Um, and so I have to say that, well, you know, that's like 31st in the country. That's their bread and butter. It's because they're constantly putting pressure on the rim. It also leads to very high field goal numbers, uh, free throw numbers, I'm sorry. They're shooting over 21 free throws a game. Um, that's like 33rd in the country, right? Um, sorry, 23rd in the country. Uh, and then a lot of these are assisted drop-offs and that kind of stuff at 12.9 uh, assists. That ends up being more like 204th in the country. We'll get to more about what that is in a second. Um, interesting that they're doing this older school style of basketball. Where it's attack, attack, attack. Not a whole lot of kick out for open threes and stuff like that. Uh, they do score 75 and a half points per game, which is decent to say the least. Uh, their offense, though, is a lot of pick and roll, uh, empty side kind of stuff, and then back cuts on the far side. So if the pick and roll, the empty side is happening on the right side of the floor, on the left side, that runs some sort of a back screen action or just a straight back cut to kind of get multiple guys attacking the rim at once. I imagine Houston packs it in some and forces long contested threes just because they seem uncomfortable doing that for long stretches of games. 
I don't see them doing a whole lot of that. Now, I did mention that I think they pass the ball very well but have low assist numbers, and that's because they have such a high offensive rebound percentage and do so many putbacks per game. I mean, offensive rebound percentage, along with Lancers of the Big South Conference, are 11th in the nation at 36.9%. That means um, that means 37% of their misses, more or less, right? Uh, 37% are getting rebounded by Longwood. That's a lot. That's a high percentage. Now, Houston has always done very highly uh, themselves and played AM, who does it very highly early this year as well, and has won games this season where they didn't win the rebounding battle. But I have to say that that's the fear is that Longwood's going to rebound their twos, have a bunch of guys around the rim for putbacks and stuff like that. Their guards rebound well. Their rebounding numbers are fairly evenly distributed. I mean, they got guards rebounding four uh, rebounds per game, bigs rebounding closer to six rebounds per game. Again, they they evenly distribute that job amongst themselves. On defense, uh, they allow 34.3% three-point field goal percentage. That's not very good at the national level. Uh, they also allow 50% from two, uh, allowing 32% or 32 shots, I'm sorry, from inside the arc per game and give up 19 free throws. That kind of adds up to a lot of porous defense. Now, I know that's not like the uh, what the scheme is necessarily. Like, I, I think Aldridge is a decent coach. And when they won the conference two years ago, it was a little bit different schematic or a little different results, I should say. But they really do have trouble staying in front of people. Uh, they only allow 8.1 offense rebounds per game. Part of that's because they allow fairly high field goal percentages. But part of that, I think, is because they're a very good rebounding team. That's 19th nationally on what how many uh, rebounds, offense rebounds that they allow. And they force 13.8 turnovers per game, and that's that's really good. I do think, though, in watching them, that this is going to be a big Joan Roberts assist game. We had word from practice on Thursday. Sounds like he told reporters he feels good to go, he feels rested, and like he's you know feeling pretty healthy. Clips from practice looked like he was moving around pretty well. Um, and the way he skips the ball, he gets the ball in those low post ISOs, right? And the way he skips the ball across the court to the backside, that's the kind of thing that looks like to me Longwood gives up a lot. The backside skip pass, because they're packing in so much, makes they don't give up two pointers. The backside skip is open. If Houston's hitting threes, this could be over early, early. They did show zone at different points in both the high point and UNC Asheville games. Um, and honestly, I'd imagine with a seven footer down low, we'll talk about him in the second segment when we talk about key players. But um, honestly, if Houston is not hitting their threes, I imagine they spend a lot of time in a two, three zone or a, it's really almost a one or like a two, two, one kind of zone. The way they play those wings on the back side, the back line of that, now, they have a seven-footer down low, but those wings are more like 6'4", six, 6'6", six, six active guys, and they all funnel stuff to the big fella. He's not, like, killing it on blocks per game. He's got 0 0.9 blocks per game on the season, um, but he is deterring a lot of shots, it looks like to me, which, you know, in some ways might be just as impactful, especially with how well they rebound the basketball. Now, their big flaw their big flaw in terms of the way they play is they commit 12 and a half turnovers per game. Um, and the opponents typically would only get about six steals per game against them. That means they're getting over six turnovers. that are somewhat self-inflicted. And I have to say that against Houston, if they don't clean that up again, this thing could be over early. Now, I'm sure they're going to rise to the occasion. I'm sure they're going to play the best basketball they've ever played against Houston because the way things tend to go. But I do think also that for what it's worth, as I look at this, um, Houston, if Houston's like in the right mindset, you know, awake at the start, this could be one of those games where you see Houston jump out to a, you know, 14 to nothing, you know, hadn't allowed a field goal or hadn't allowed a made field goal in the first eight or 10 minutes kind of thing because of the speed Houston plays with, the way that they turn it over. And frankly, if Houston packs in and makes them shoot threes, the uncomfort it looks like they have with shooting the basketball from deep. Now, again, I think they shoot a decent percentage, it looks like, but they need to be really open to pull the trigger in both games. They they don't they need a lot of space to do it. They don't just like pull up over the tops of defensive guys. It's not a hand down, man down situation. It's gonna be a little bit further away. Um, I want to talk about the key guys they got in the matchups that they're gonna have. 
uh, and I, who I think is going to cover who for Houston. But I also want to talk about like as we're approaching March Madness and as we're looking here at bracket highlights and all kinds of things that are going on. We're going to talk about the bracket highlight that's brought to you by our friends at Nissan because each week we're picking a team that stands out, a team that push it further than the rest. Just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys are able to take it to the next level. The Oakland Golden Grizzlies are obviously this week's Nissan Rogue. We'll talk about more that, about them at the end of the show. But that team absolutely surprised us all with powerful performance in the first round upset against the Kentucky Wildcats, giving them their biggest win in program history. They say win life, go rogue, and that's exactly what the Ducks have done here. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next Big time adventure. This episode is also brought to you by the Spring Cleaning Champions Manscaped. This season, make sure you groom your carpets and drapes with the leaders in below the waist. Grooming clear out that winter bush, the Manscaped Lawnmower 5.0, and watch your confidence bloom like springtime flowers. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. For manscaped.com, you can use code LOCKED ON, L O C K E D, for 20% off and free shipping, uh, all kinds of different other products on their site as well. But the fifth generation trimmer features two interchangeable next-gen skin-safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little bit off the top, and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. Get 20% off with free shipping. Use code locked on L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, at manscapes.com. It's 20% off and free shipping with code locked on at manscapes.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. All right, I want to talk some about the personnel here, and I would point out that several of these guys, because the coach has his Houston ties, are from the city of Houston. But the star of the show, the guy that will get the Jamal Shedd matchup and Jamal Shedd defensive treatment, is Waylon Na- uh, Napper. Now, he's their best player, and he is the head of the snake, the center of the scouting report, the top guy. He, he's the point guard. But he's also the leading scorer. Um, he is the leading assist guy, but he seems to be more of a score and assist as it happens kind of guy for them. Um, he attacks right more than left, but I would not call him a right hand dominant player. Uh, like I saw him described on one side, I don't think that's a fair assessment. Um, he he just attacks the rim. He attacks the rim relentlessly, and frankly. If he gets by his first defender, I don't anticipate him getting by Jamal a whole lot, but if he gets by his first defender, he's really, really good at making that help defender or rim defender miss. This crafty, creates good space on his floaters. Um, and on the whole, Longwood plays relatively slow in terms of possessions per game or possession length, et cetera, um, as you'd see on Ken Palm and other analytical kind of breakdowns. But he's really good at picking spots to speed things up and kind of you know help uh, quick the pay, quicken the pace for them. Um, he's a good open shooter off the catch or the dribble. He just I wouldn't call him like a jump shooter, not because he can't do it, but honestly more so because it's just not the most important thing he does. He's going to attack the rim, attack the rim, attack the rim, and put pressure on the defense. He's also a Pretty stout kid. And he's listed at six foot one eighty five. I actually thought looking at him, he looked closer to two hundred on film. He's got really long arms, um, so I think he'll get the Jamal Shed matchup just because of his importance. Uh, the other guard is actually the guard I think is the more interesting matchup. Now, uh, D. A. Houston, uh, D. Avion Houston is from uh, Bel Air Episcopal. Uh, actually, I had to coach against this kid many years ago, and he's a very different looking basketball player now. He's still the same tenacity, uh, but he is a big, strong guard. Listen, 6'1, 215. I mean, closer to a running back build. And again, 6'1, 215 sticks out visibly on film as a strong guard. He's not slow, he's very, very quick. And I go back and forth here because of his stout nature. I kind of wish we could put Emmanuel Sharp on him. He's, you know, DA Houston's always in control. Um, he is square shoulders, facing the rim, looking up. You're not going to steal the ball away from him because he's so strong. 
But Sharp is a pretty strong defender himself and has a like, broad chest and gets in the way well. Um, I kind of wish that was the matchup. We'll get to why I don't know that it will be in a second. I think this is going to be the LJ Cryer matchup because he's the off guard when both he and Nap, uh, Nap are on the floor. Um, now, he is much stronger than Sharp. I could see that being a potential matchup problem. Um, he's not like their best score. He gets like six and a half points per game. Some, But he has six and a half points per game because some games he got like nothing and some games he had like 14, right? So like it kind of average, averages back down. Um, what he's really good at doing is at that slow methodical pace when it's time to go slow, he's kind of one of the guys that helps steer the ship helps run the offense, et cetera. Again, they get the ball to his inside pick and rolls, and he's so strong that as he turns the corner, his broad shoulders, the ball is so far away from the defender there. He's a really important part of what they do. He'll play a lot of minutes in this basketball game, I'd imagine. Um, again, I think it's the choir matchup because uh, Massey, right? Uh, Jonathan Massey uh, is a, another Houstonian on this roster. Uh, he went to Legacy High School. Um, he's six, six, uh, he's a little bit longer. He's also a strong guy listed at six, six, two Oh five. Uh, I think because he's a little bit bigger guy, you can't put he taller as well. So I don't think you can put crier there. I think you got to put sharp there, which is why I think you got to put crier on Houston. Um, he's quick and massy. This is as quick and decisive. He's not like fancy. He's not going to do a bunch of crossovers. He's going to go like right to left attack. Left to right, attack, maybe in and out dribble, explode. He just he's gonna be decisive in his movements and he understands that with how athletic and explosive he is, if he gets that, you know, hip to hip, you tell a receiver you get even and leave him, he gets that kind of hip to hip and explodes past guys a lot. Um, he will pump fake and attack the rim. He will probably have a cool dunk in this game for being completely honest. Um, he gets eleven point four points per game. He and the power forward, Michael Christmas, we'll talk about in a second, um, both get over 11 points per game. The difference here is that um, Massey shoots three threes per game, where Christmas is like closer to two and a half. Neither guy at high volume uh, necessarily. Both guys, frankly, look very similar in size and stature at their forward slash wing spots. Massey's a little bit more guard-like. So I think he gets the Emmanuel Sharp call. Uh, unfortunately, that means that Sharp can't guard D.A. Houston. That would be rotations where things are different, right? Um, I really think, honestly, there's a great lineup here where you could, like, Wilson in the game or Damian Dunn in the game, and they can cover these longer forward wing types, and they can get Sharp down there on D.A. Houston. The deal is if Cryer's hitting threes, you also want him in the game, and you can't take Jamal Shedd out. So who goes where, you know, is obviously a little bit challenging there. Um, but I, I think that Massey is going to demand sharp and so that leaves Cryer on Houston. Uh, Michael Christmas is their listed power forward. He'll get Jalen Roberts, um, not just because of his position, but he's a forward that plays on the perimeter in every sense of it. Um, he shoots 41% from three, but again, super low volume down closer to two and a half of those a game. So he'll shoot two and make one let's say he shoots three he might make a second we'll see um he's a lot more of a driver in the unc Asheville game he had a really impressive dunk early on where he pumped he made a three he later pump faked got the defender in the air because didn't read the scouting report that i write and didn't realize that he's only going to shoot two of those a game and maybe make one and blew by him and then took off from outside the charge circle and threw it down right-handed really really good athlete really big strong guy again like we said he's not much bigger in terms of his measurables than Jonathan Massey. Um, but he, you know, 6'6", 220 versus 6'6", 205 at 15 pounds. It, it looks like a lot more than 15 pounds on him. I don't know why that is, but maybe, you know, their measurements are a little bit off online, right? But he looks a lot bigger and stronger than Massey, more so than 15 pounds. The interesting matchup that I think they go with, they, frankly, they've started two different centers over the course of the season at different points, kind of based on who they're playing. I think they're going to get Simon Cipala. Uh, that's the seven footer from Poland. Um, he is seven foot and he probably has closer to a seven, five wingspan, um, super tall and long. And 
he's I'm gonna be honest, he's kind of slow footed, he's kind of methodical, um, but he op, he functions almost like a net at the rim. The way he sticks his arms out wide with how long that wingspan is and how high he is up, his just hands are off the ground. He covers a lot of space, a lot of putback opportunities and stuff like that. Was really impressed with him when they do those empty side pick and rolls. Um, he's not rolling for lobs. He's not rolling for drop offs. He's rolling to try and find a, po- a place to repost up. And he's really, really good at posting up and getting more intentional looks down there. Between his length and Christmas's strength, they do a lot of traditional post ups in that second uh tertiary type of offense right and so interesting to say the least i'll be interested to see how javier francis handles that matchup could also see said lot getting some minutes um because of how short they are at other forward spots i could see houston going with damian dumb Malik wilson and then moving j1 roberts over at handles apala as well one of their centers they put in rotation although he doesn't play as much as the other two is listed at 6'6", uh, Johan Zemi uh, from Connecticut. Um, he is a junkyard dog type center, listed at 6'6", 230. Um, and he's, you know, he's a kind of guy that absolutely could see J1 if they Houston went small playing and playing down there with that center as well because J1 would still be taller than him, frankly. Um, interesting match, to say the least. The interesting thing I would also say is the quality of guy Houston's bench is much higher, much more impactful, but they're going to play 10 guys at Longwood. And so depending on if you value quality or quantity in a first-round matchup uh, uh, in, in, you know, fouling and bench, bench depth and all that, um, that's going to be kind of how you decide which bench you go with and which bench you give the better grade to there. I think Houston wins most of these matchups, but I hope I'm stressing a little bit on like how – these guys are talented. They have things they do well. And frankly, they've kind of figured it out, of course, the season as evidenced by winning their conference tournament. Now, I want to talk some about the rest of the South region and March Madness as a whole. But, you know, if you're looking to get to some of these games, there's no better place to get tickets than game time because right now you can get $20 off if you use code LOCKED ON to any kind of sporting event, concert, theater, comedy show, whatever's going on in the city you're in, use Game Time, download the Game Time app today to get tickets to it. They got all kinds of cool things. You can say, hey, I want like this section in this row. You give them an average of 18% savings if you let them do the rest of, of the work from there. If you say, I want this seat, but I want to know what it looks like first. I'm trying to compare them. They'll show you from the seat what the exact viewing angle is. They have all kinds of great things to help you make sure you're getting the best deal. And if you can find a better price in the same section and row they'll give you 110 percent back of the difference to make sure that you're getting the best price available so go to the game time down the game time app today create an account and you just go locked on l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n for 20 dollars off your first purchase again terms apply but you create an account redeem code to locked on for 20 dollars off download game time today last minute tickets lowest prices gear run teed All right, so as we look at the South region, I don't mean to get ahead of ourselves. Houston has got to beat Longwood for any of this to matter, right? For them to not be the – no one wants to be the third team or the next team to lose to a 16 seed. Uh, Last year, Purdue did it. Um, You know, A few years back, Virginia did it. It has happened twice. You cannot assume anything. But I will say, in the spirit of March Madness, it has been interesting to watch – how the rest of the bracket unfolded in the most immediate future uh, affecting who Houston could see as early as like the elite eight in the South regional. Um, I guess I'll start with the one that just wrapped up as I'm recording this Uh, NC state knocked off fellow big 12 power, Texas tech. Um, I was looking forward to a potential Texas tech matchup. I think Houston's game plans looked really good against them both times they played. And frankly, the best thing Tech has had going forward all season is hard to play in Lubbock. I think McCaslin is going to turn that program around. But on the whole, I was kind of looking forward to potentially seeing them again because I felt comfortable in that one. NC State in that game with the way it opened, and the way they kept a 10-point or double-digit lead for most of the game, um, I would say it's safe to say they have not run out of steam 
from how that ACC tournament played out. Um, NC State has a really, really impressive and like unique athlete at their big fella. Um, now, I have to say, I'm trying to make sure I got his uh, name correct here. Okay, yes, it is DJ Burns Jr. I was worried about the J being a junior, doing us be repetitive, but DJ Burns Jr. is listed at 6'9, 275. And when I tell you he's got great footwork, trust me on this one, he does. I'm impressed to watch him play in that game against Texas Tech. Kind of had them spinning around a little bit. Um, the story of the night in, in all of March Badness comes out of the South Regional. Uh, that is that Oakland behind 10 threes from bench player. Uh, Golke, Jack Golke, um, 6'3", guy that comes off the bench for them, averages 12 points per game, so I don't mean to say he doesn't play, but hits 10 three-pointers to knock off Kentucky in the South Regional. And the way that impacts Houston, I think, in both cases is, um, frankly, there were a lot of people that saw the scoring upside of a Kentucky as a potential problem for Houston. Right, Houston has had stretches of games this season. It's both games they win and lost. Uh, they won and lost, where they had trouble scoring the basketball for you know four minutes here, three minutes there. Not that they weren't getting good shots; they just didn't go in. Right, their legs are tired from all the defense or or whatever. Right, Kentucky can fill it up, and they, some people would say, we're going to present a problem. I didn't think so. We can go back and check the tape there. I did not think so, but people did. Oakland took them out. Right now, Oakland is better than I think people realize, but on the whole, different kind of threat, right? Um, Texas Tech, again, some people pointed out it's hard to beat a team three times in the same season. Well, that potential threat is also gone. I'd argue NC State presents a very different one, but that's the way that thing goes. Now, as I look across here, I still think one of the more threatening teams is Honestly, 12 seeded James Madison, who Houston could see as early as the Sweet 16. That game will tip off at the same time as Houston's game on different TV stations. If you're a TV person, if they're in person in Memphis, power to you. Um, that's that's gonna be a fun place to be. You got AM, you got Baylor, a lot of Texans making the trip over to Memphis for first round games this weekend. Um but I still think James Madison is the biggest challenge. They'll again tip off at the exact same time they're playing Wisconsin. Depends on which kind of Wisconsin team they play. Other games across the board here. Uh, Big 12 didn't look so great against Duquesne. BYU falls to Duquesne by four points. I thought they were going to come back and win that thing in the second half. Fortunately, unfortunately, they did not. Iowa State, on the other hand, did look really good against South Dakota State. Held court, uh, won the 215 matchup by 17 points. Um, Kansas, as of the recording of this, has had a lead on Sanford over the course of the game. That lead has dwindled down to single digits. Okay, had to cut back in here. They got screwed. Sanford could have, should have, probably deserves to have knocked off Kansas. So in my little recap here of what all did happen with the Big 12, I guess Kansas does move on to the next round. But, man, they really almost blew it. They should have blown it. That should have been called a block at the end of that basketball game. Absurd, absurd, absurd. Across the rest of the Big 12, uh, UT Austin did win. Future Big 12 school Arizona did win. Um, who else? I mentioned Iowa State. Uh, on the whole, the Big 12 came across winning more games than they lost, and that's all strong and fine and dandy. Um, and on an injured shoulder, Hunter Dickinson apparently got 19 points and 20 rebounds. I can't believe they blew that call at the end of the game. I, I could do a, If this were a Kansas show or a Stanford show, I could do a whole lot about that. That's bad. Uh, I will say, as far as Houston goes, this does impact us, I guess, as the Big 12 moves on. Uh, they're not in the South Regional. Um, so I'm not going to say it impacts, us, impacts us a whole lot directly, so I don't think Kansas is making it to the Final Four out of the uh, Midwest region. But I will say that in our region, we did have our own great upset in Oakland and NC State, kind of as one as well, and we'll see how those things play out. Now, most of our bracket, our regional, play on Friday. Uh, Nebraska and A&M, who Houston would play if they beat Longwood, they tip off just before Houston at 550. 
Um, other games of note, Duke and Vermont has a lot of people wondering. That game tips off at 6.10, all central time, I guess I should say. Marquette, you want to see what Kolick looks like healthy, um, how healthy he potentially is. They tip off at 1 o'clock. So a day full of basketball pertaining to the Houston Cougars in the South Regional. We're breaking it all down here after the game with Cougars after dark to talk about what happens with Houston and Longwood and whatever is to happen next. Locked on Cougs is a proud member of the Locked on Pockets Network. That means your team, our Houston Cougars, each and every day. Go Cougs.